Nationwide measles cases are nearing the 1,000 mark. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the 2019 outbreak, which has spread to 26 states, is the worst since 1992. The most recent numbers show that there are 981 cases of measles in the United States. Now, because of these numbers, lawmakers are working to make it more difficult for parents to opt out of vaccinations. Most recently in Massachusetts, Congressman Andy Vargas introduced legislation that would remove the religious exemption for school children. Joining me now to discuss the seriousness of the measles outbreak, vaccinations and more is the 20th Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Jerome Adams. He previously served as a health commissioner of Indiana, where he led the state's responses to Ebola, Zika and the largest HIV outbreak in the United States. Dr. Adams, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me here. I really appreciate it. So, Doctor, what explains the troubling rise to nearly 1,000 in measles? Is it purely just anti-vaccination? Is it many people who are just opting out of vaccines? Well, we're almost at 1,000 cases, as you mentioned, and the majority of those cases are occurring in people who have not been vaccinated. So it really is a, uh, a, a campaign of misinformation out there mm -hmm. that's causing this unprecedented situation. What can you do to combat that misinformation, Doctor? Because what we have seen is with a lot of these people, they're inherently distrustful of the government. They would accuse us both of being bought out by Big Pharma mm -hmm. for, for going against them. How I, do I've we, heard it on my Twitter. How do we talk to already distrustful people who we can understand? You're, it's scary to watch your kid get vaccines. How do we assure them that it is completely safe for both them and for the rest of the community? Well, number one, we have to say it over and over. Vaccines uh -huh. are safe. They're effective. They're the most important public health intervention of the last hundred years. Ranks right up there with, uh, with many of the other things that we consider uh, critical to public health. Uh, but we also have to understand, and I have uh, three young kids myself, 14, 13, and and nine, that uh, parents who choose not to vaccinate still really just want what's best for their kids. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we can't demonize them. We have to sit down with them. We have to be willing to have compassionate conversations with them. And here's one more very important point. 93% uh, of people out there do choose to get their kids vaccinated. So most people are doing the right thing. I think that's important and folks don't appreciate that. We have some folks who are vaccine resistant. They're never gonna change. But the majority of the folks who aren't getting their kids vaccinated, I say, are vaccine hesitant. Mm -hmm. And we just need to take the time, answer their questions, and many of them make the right choice. I think that's exactly the right point because too often we'll look at these big, oh, you're so stupid, you're endangering mm -hmm. the community. Possibly true. However, we have to recognize that screaming at somebody is not going to make them change their mind for such an important public health decision. Now, what are you doing about the misinformation crisis? Is it by appearing on programs like this, or are there other government opportunities that we're taking to make sure that the public knows exactly how safe a vaccine is? Well, we have a multifaceted response. So I went to Vancouver, Washington, where one of the outbreaks occurred and literally met with folks on the ground. Uh, I this morning was in touch with officers in the Commission Corps, which I head in New York City, who are working with the state uh, health department and local officials to help uh, get into the Orthodox Jewish community there mm -hmm. where the problems are occurring. It's important to understand each of these outbreaks is a little bit different. The population in Washington is different than the population in New York is different than the population in uh, Minneapolis where the outbreak occurred last year. So we're really taking a deep dive into these communities. And then just yesterday, I participated in a digital media platform where uh, we talked to people from Twitter, from Pinterest, mm -hmm. helping make sure folks can get access to correct information and not misinformation. Yes. So one of the most troubling things I've seen online is that you know when you Google vaccine information, you go on mm -hmm. Amazon to search for books, there is so much anti-vaccination literature out there. What is the government doing in order to combat that? I mean, like you said, you can appear as much as possible. Are we putting out our own pamphlets? Are we promoting the work of like some of the great, some of the great doctors out of Rice University who've written great books about how vaccines are completely safe and do not cause autism? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, we're working with CDC, with uh -huh. NIH, uh, it's, a, it's a total HHS effort and we're all out there uh, trying to combat this misinformation but it's really gonna take an all hands on deck approach. So I tell parents, I tell doctors, I tell community officials and legislators, it's important that we all say loudly, vaccines are safe, mm -hmm. they're effective, and they're a proven public health intervention. So what do you make of these efforts by some lawmakers to make it mandatory? Now, as a, as a, as a physician, do you mm -hmm. think that that would help or hurt the campaign to have all Americans vaccinated or all those who need vaccines to get the vaccine? Well, let me be clear about this. The science yeah. tells us very much that states that have only medical exemptions 
have higher vaccination rates. And the more that you allow for uh, religious exemptions and uh, philosophical exemptions, the higher your non-vaccination rates go up and the more you're at risk for a vaccine preventable outbreak. Hmm. That's a very important point then as we consider that. I'd also like to turn to the phenomenon of teen vaping. Now, yes. this is something we've seen a troubling rise in the amount of nicotine use amongst uh, teens. Now, the FDA put out some guidelines in the last year saying fla flavored e-cigarettes can only be sold in tobacco and vape shops. There'll be heightened measures to verify age for online sales. They're banning flavored cigars and they're pursuing the removal of products that are marketed to children. However, the outgoing commissioner, uh, Scott Gottlieb, said that this alone may not have been enough and that the new numbers may make it so that an outright ban on reusable pod-based nicotine services should be considered. What, what is your opinion on this? I'm, well, Dr. Gottlieb and I yes. both are very concerned about the situation. Uh, just last year in November, I put out the second Surgeon General's advisory in over 10 years, helping folks understand that there's been a 78% increase in high schoolers' use of these <coughs> products. We've seen tobacco use amongst youth go down over the last decade. It's now starting to go back up because of e-cigarettes. And it's a fundamentally different product we have uh, compared to the e-cigarettes of old, too. It uh, delivers much more nicotine and uh, we're hearing from high school principals from parents the kids out there now are rapidly becoming addicted to these products so I'm worried the numbers are going to get worse this year and I'm worried that if we don't really lean into it then it's going to limit adult access to these products among people who are smoking and using them to quit. I've heard anecdotal evidence of you can't go into a high school bathroom in a free period these days without just seeing jewel smoke all, all well, up Well and again I have a yeah. 14, a 13 yeah. and a 9 year old and uh -huh. they've all been exposed to it at their schools. Uh -huh. Fortunately their dad's the Surgeon General <laughs> but I'm hoping that uh, we can help other parents understand the dangers right. of these products and help children avoid well, e-cigarette use. Lay, lay out for, for the audience here why is it so you know, that's always the, the defense of these devices which is it's just nicotine all the tar and all that is out there why is it bad for a developing brain to be addicted to nicotine well it can yeah. cause attention problems memory yeah. problems we know that exposing youth to addictive substances uh, while the brain is still developing which is up till the age of 25 can cause lifelong problems or contribute to lifelong problems we also know that it's a gateway to addiction for other substances and uh, there's a compelling data out there that suggests that children who start using e-cigarettes will switch to com combustible uh -huh. uh, tobacco. So again, uh, I hope we all can agree no youth should use e-cigarettes and we should do all we can to combat this epidemic. Well, that, that, that is heartening to hear and we haven't yet received the numbers out for 2018. And I encourage and, parents yeah. and your viewers to go to SurgeonGeneral.gov and uh -huh. view my uh, advisory. It lists tips for parents, for teachers, for providers to help uh, limit youth use of e-cigarettes. Right. Well, it just seems seems that the marketing of these products is ubiquitous. It's in the gas stations, which are next to schools. It has flavored products. It's, it's basically become a teen sensation and embedded mm -hmm. within their culture. So some sort of government response is going to have to be just as robust to combat that, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. We know that, that in other countries, they have a much greater response to uh, advertising. And again, at, uh, talking to the digital media platforms, we know mm -hmm. that they're uh, advertising for, for these different devices in apps and in games yep. that kids are, are looking at. So I think we need to help everyone understand they've got a social responsibility to make sure we aren't addicting a new generation of children to nicotine. I also, just because you mentioned it there, whenever it comes to games, are you concerned about the addictive <laughs> online use amongst children? Is that something that the Surgeon General has been looking at? I know I've seen some troubling data about rising suicide amongst teenagers, particularly teenage girls. Is that linked to social media? And what's your, what's your guidelines out there for parents at looking at these emergent new phenomenons? Well, we're always paying attention to emerging new phenomena. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we uh, maximize the upside of, of technology. We, we want to make sure that we aren't creating new problems. And we know uh -huh. that the same areas of the brain light up when you log into your social media platforms light up when you uh, get a hit of nicotine mm. or when you get a hit of cocaine. So it's definitely something we're worried about. We're also worried about marijuana use. We know that one third of youth who vape actually report vaping mm. marijuana. And it's a fundamentally different product out there nowadays much more potent. It's not the marijuana of, of your Woodstock days. Right. And so, again, a lot going on in the youth culture right now, but it really comes back to substance misuse, um, it, particularly in the developing brain, leads to lifelong yeah. problems. Just last question on nicotine here. So Senator McConnell wants to raise the nicotine age to 21. Is that something that would, would fall within the guidelines uh, uh, for the Surgeon General? Uh, tobacco 21, particularly when it includes 
e-cigarettes and vaping devices and when it's inclusive of the military community uh -huh. is a evidence-based strategy which we know will limit the number of people who go on to using tobacco products uh, throughout oh, their lives. That's a strong data point. I also like to turn to marijuana and that's something that you talked mm -hmm. about here. So there's particularly been a rise in the amount of pregnant mothers that are using mm -hmm. marijuana. I have some of my own theories here which is that this, there's because we've been told by the big pot community for so long that marijuana is safe to use and nobody's ever died from it that no there's no stigma that has yet developed on using marijuana with uh, while you're pregnant. What, what, what are you looking at whenever it comes to this? Well, again, as I said, the, the marijuana of even 10 years ago was less than 5% THC, which is a product which causes you to get high, which can uh -huh. cause addiction, which can cause problems. The new strains that are professionally grown are 10, 15, 20% THC, and then when you vape them or dab them through these new devices, folks are getting 50, 60, 70% THC delivered. So I like to have a glass of wine every once mm -hmm. in a while. Don't tell the folks the Surgeon General is, is having <laughs> a glass of wine, but that doesn't mean I endorse going out and drinking a pint of grain alcohol. Right. And that is the difference between the uh, marijuana of old and the delivery of THC nowadays, and that's particularly uh, harmful to de the developing brain all the way down to the fetus and we we we've heard of communities where up to uh, one in five women report using marijuana during pregnancy. That's mm -hmm. very, very concerning to me. That is very troubling. And, and so lo a lot of this is paired with the growing legalization effort. Mm -hmm. We see legalization and decriminalization hap happening across the country. It's becoming almost a phenomenon that marijuana use is becoming accepted exactly. in our society. Is that a bad thing for America? Well, th there is multiple different components to the argument. There's a real social justice discussion. There's a discussion about the medicinal components of mm -hmm. marijuana. And marijuana is over 100 different components. So not marijuana in general right. is good, but there are potential for, for medicinal properties and some of the components. And then as you mentioned, there's the adult use or recreational argument. And I think we have to have the courage to have a more nuanced conversation. Mm -hmm. We've got to be concerned about the health effects. And studies show that in, in places where they've legalized marijuana for recreational use or youth use, I'm sorry, or medicinal use, that youth attitudes about the dangers of marijuana have significantly changed in the wrong direction. Right. And so particularly on this, I'm interested, is, does it still make sense to classify marijuana as a Schedule One drug, which prohibits medical medical reasons? I mean, I think that is one of the more compelling things that I've mm -hmm. seen, particularly, like you said, whenever it comes to a social justice argument. Well, I think that there's a lot of... Um, uh, uh, misinformation out there about about the difficulties to do research and mm -hmm. so NIH the DEA HHS has worked hard to make it easier for folks to do research on marijuana and we want to make sure we can do research in this area so we can figure out where's the upside and where's the downside sure. I worry about uh, descheduling it because again that that gives the impression that this product is perfectly safe right and so we're trying to figure out where the sweet spot is mm -hmm. and in the meantime we're pushing hard to make it easier for more people to do research. Some of the more compelling new arguments I've seen about this, particularly a man named Alex Berenson, who wrote mm -hmm. a new book called Tell Your Children. He's warning about the troubling link between marijuana use and outbreak of psychosis. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we're looking at as well? Well, again, uh, you have much higher THC contents in these new strains of marijuana, and mm -hmm. so we're going to see more and more negative side effects. We know scientifically that, that there is a certain group of people who will experience psychosis and mental health problems when they're exposed to marijuana, and as you increase the THC content and you increase the number of people who are using the products, you're going to see more negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is a concern. And I believe he's been looking at, at population-wide data coming out of Europe, which is showing you know large links to, of marijuana use to the outbreak of new cases of schizophrenia. So it is troubling. And the final question I have for you, sir, is just outline your overarching goal as Surgeon General in this new era. What we've talked about here are emergent phenomena. Mm -hmm. We are not talking about things that you would even probably have looked at as Surgeon General five years ago. How do you keep up with this government bureaucracy when our children, and it seems that our adults, are have an onslaught of all of these new health problems, and how do we develop government policy around that? That's a great question, yeah. and I'd say the common denominator is health and wellness in communities. It's important that everyone understands that medical care, while important, is only 10 to 20 percent of our overall health. 80% of our health is our environment, are the behaviors that we engage in, are, are the, uh, the negative and the positive things we're exposed to when we're younger. And if we really dig into building healthier communities and creating resilience, you're going to see less substance misuse, whether it's marijuana, whether it's opioids, or whether it's e-cigarettes. And uh, quite frankly, the studies show you'll also see less cardiovascular disease, less diabetes, uh -huh. less cancer. And so 
I'm really going around the country and helping folks understand that communities that invest in health are more profitable, they're safer, and they see less negative outcomes in the short term and the long term. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Doctor, and we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. It's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. So we'll have more coming up for you on Rising.